So today's presentation, Oncologic Emergencies with Jacob Stein, MD. And Dr. Stein is a North Carolina native, born and raised in Durham before attending Emory University in Atlanta for his undergraduate degree in English and creative writing while maintaining a focus on pre-medical training. He attended UNC for medical school and obtained his master's in public health as well, as he honed his interests in clinical medicine and the health of the broader population. He obtained his residency training at the University of Washington in Seattle and stayed on as part of the hospital medicine facility for a year before returning to UNC for his hematology oncology fellowship in 2019. He is now involved in research on how to reduce disparities in the delivery of high quality cancer care to historically marginalized groups while training to be an academic oncologist. He enjoys his time outside the hospital as well with his wife and one-year-old daughter, as well as playing music, hiking, grilling, playing basketball, and reading. Wow. So, uh, Dr. Stein, welcome. We are so glad to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me, Tim. Absolutely. What, what, anything else we should know outside of your professional bio and a, and a little bit of, about your personal life there? Well, I'll say uh, the music and child piece have come together. So I used to like playing, you know, the Beatles or the Almond Brothers. Uh, now I'm learning favorites like Rain, Rain, Go Away or Wheels Around the Bus, you know, Wheels on the Bus Go Round and Round. So sort of bringing the music and the child together, which is really fun. Oh, good for you. That, that's great to hear. Well, th thank you again for being here today. Um, I mentioned poll everywhere. <clears throat> so here's our first question. Cancer patients can experience medical emergencies from complications of the disease and or from the treatment. So that's a true false, and we'll, we'll pop that up in just a minute. Uh, the, we always make this first one a real softball. And while we're doing that, I'll say this activity has been planned and implemented under the sole supervision of the course directors in association with the UNC Office of Continuing Professional Development. William A. Wood, MD, MPH, and CPD staff have no relevant relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. Jacob Stein, MD, has no financial relationships with commercial interests as defined by the ACCME. And now let's go ahead and take a look at that poll everywhere question. Uh, so already uh, we've had a number of folks answer that. We'll keep that up for a few more seconds. Um, Dr. Stein, how are they doing so far? They're doing great, Tim. Looks like I don't have much to talk about today. We, we've got it covered. We, we can say <laughs> thank you and come up. Wait, no, we can't do that. We, I'm sorry. I, I know they actually have a lot to learn from you, and we couldn't give them a spot of credit without uh, the full lecture either, so let, let's keep moving. Um, okay, so oncologic emergencies, um, I'll let you take it away from here. Thanks so much, Tim, and, and you can go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, so, and you can go ahead and put up the objectives for me. We're going to talk through the most important clinical emergencies in oncology, and the way that I think is most helpful to do that is in a case-based format. So we'll go through uh, a number of cases. I have seven cases. Depending on how we do on timing, we'll get through um, either six or, or all of them if we can. Um, and we'll review some of the key points in how to diagnose oncologic emergencies, how to manage them, and how some kind of key learning points uh, for all of us. And again, I don't have any uh, relevant to disclosures to share. Next slide. So let's start with our first case. And I think, Tim, will you read the cases for us? Yes, I'll be happy to do that. So a 75-year-old man with recent diagnosis of lung cancer presents to the ER with back pain. He also mentions that he has had several falls in the past week and his feet feel clumsy. MRI spine shows a vert uh, vertebral body mass or vertebral body mass with extension into the epidural space and compression of the spinal cord with associated cord edema. And we do have our first uh, poll everywhere slide. So what is the most appropriate next step in management? And that would be uh, A, biopsy of the epidural mass, uh, B, corticosteroids followed by radiation therapy, C, platinum-based chemotherapy, or D, radiation therapy alone. And again, this is all anonymous, so take your best guess, and let's take uh, six or seven more seconds to uh, go ahead and, and put in your response. 
Okay, uh, Dr. Stein, how's that looking? Yeah, they're doing great, and I would say, um, so B is the correct answer, corticosteroids followed by radiation therapy. I certainly understand the instinct by some of our folks to want to get a biopsy to know what we're dealing with here, um, but I'll go through some detail about why uh, emergent treatment is, is needed in this case before pursuing a tissue biopsy. And we can go back to the uh, slides. Yeah, so, you know, most of us here, are, myself included, are not neuroradiologists. I don't expect people to be able to look at MRIs themselves. But you can see this is what we're talking about. It's, it's cancer that is uh, extending into the, the epidural space, putting pressure on the cord. And indeed, you can see uh, a narrowing of the cord and, in fact, some associated edema, kind of those grayish changes in the spinal canal. Next slide. And this is more common than you might think. So about 1 in 20... Uh, cancer patients take all comers um, is affected by spinal cord compression. This is most common in some of our solid oncology, you know, solid malignancies. Breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate are, are likely the three most prevalent, but we can see it in a wide range, including non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, renal cell carcinoma, multiple myeloma certainly can have significant bone involvement. And in and of itself, this is a poor prognostic um, factor. So folks, uh, the mortality is about six months, survival is about six months after a diagnosis of spinal cord compression. Next slide. And this is critical, obviously we're in an oncologic emergencies talk, critical to diagnose and treat in a timely fashion. And the most important thing that predicts how well patients will do is their neurologic status at presentation and how quickly their symptoms come on. And that's going to give us a picture of how well folks are going to do after the fact in terms of ambulatory status, functional status, et cetera. And this is a review article that I want to highlight. Go, go back just for a second. Lawton et al. published a great review article, 2019. So by now it's already two years old, but, but really pretty updated uh, in the Journal of Clinical Oncology with an outstanding multidisciplinary review of the assessment and management of patients with metastatic spinal cord compression. And so... Um, I still use this for reference if I'm trying to make sure that I'm being thorough about all the care my patients need, and certainly it has a robust evidence base so that you can double-check the literature behind all of our recommendations. Go ahead. So the etiology um, is usually just from direct extension. On that MRI that we saw, there's a mass. It's sort of in the posterior uh, vertebral body, and it extends posteriorly into the, into the spinal cord space. We can see, especially in something like lymphoma, where uh, lymph nodes surrounding the spinal cord uh, and vertebrae can spread through neural foramina and cause compression. Or we can also see essentially lytic bone lesions that cause collapse, destruction of cortical bone and collapse of the vertebrae. And essentially it's bone fragments that are then impinging on the spinal canal. And it's important to note here, this is not just a mass effect. There is a significant inflammatory response that drives some of the neurologic dysfunction as well as the pain that patients experience in spinal cord compression. Next slide. And this is most common in the thoracic spine, and mostly that's because there's less room to operate. So even a small lesion is going to put, uh, is going to quickly put pressure on the, on the spinal cord. Uh, second most common is in the lumbar spine. It's a common site for um, spinal disease, but again, less likely to be uh, significant in terms of cord compression. And then cervical spine is the least likely, but as we can all imagine, one of the most critical and dangerous locations. Next slide. So the symptoms, um, back pain is the most common symptom, and I want to I take a moment here to point out, you know, there are um, campaigns like Choosing Wisely that I think are outstanding, that are trying to reduce overuse of medical resources or inappropriate use. Cancer, a, an underlying cancer diagnosis is a red flag for somebody presenting with back pain. So this is not the patient where you want to sort of say, well, let's see how you do over the next four to six weeks in PT. These are patients that need imaging. Um, new, new back pain in somebody with active malignancy uh, merits imaging. Next slide. So weakness is the other classic thing we think of, or of course bowel or um, bladder dysfunction. 
But I want to point out that these are not universally present and they can be late findings. So we don't want to wait until somebody develops bladder dysfunction or urinary incontinence before we think of spinal cord compression. So again, emphasizing that back pain in a cancer patient is a high risk uh, condition. And of course, folks can have sensory loss or, or gait instability that can also clue you in. As our patient said that he felt clumsy, that's probably an indicator that he's having some gait ataxia um, that is his neurologic symptom uh, requiring urgent treatment. Next slide. So once again, early recognition is essential and the imaging modality of choice is MRI. Um, and I want to point out that if you are worried about spinal cord compression, the right answer is to get the entire spine, CTL spine. And the reason for doing so is you might identify a lesion in the lower, in the lumbar region that is not putting, let's say your guess is that it's a lumbar compression and you see a, a, a lesion in the spine, but it's not putting pressure on the spinal cord. And then you say, well, what if there's one a little bit higher up and you're sort of stuck? So. And the last thing is that it doesn't always predict, the sensory level is not as predictive as we want it to be. So just because it's lower extremities affected, it could be a higher up lesion that's causing compression, but only partial compression that leaves people with lower extremity weakness. So image the whole spine with an MRI if you're concerned about cord compression. Next slide. And the treatment as, as you know, three quarters of you got correct is immediate steroids. And this gets at its pain control, it's anti-inflammatory effect for the associated cord edema. And again, this affects that uh, inflammatory milieu that happens that drives both neurologic compromise and pain. There have been a couple of studies to look at what's the right dose of steroids. Most of those have not been terribly conclusive. The, the thing I'll say, you know, these are studies, I think I have the citations down at the bottom of my slide. These are old, old studies because nobody has any interest in redoing these in the modern era. Um, they tried doing higher dose, so, so for a time it was 100 milligrams of dexamethasone, which is a huge slug of steroids, and what they saw is no significant difference in terms of neurologic outcomes, but they did see an increase in uh, adverse effects like hyperglycemia or mania or hypertension as expected. So this is my uh, treatment uh, recommendation, would be 10 milligrams IV up front, and then you want to go 16 milligrams daily in divided doses. Um, that can be a little bit provider dependent. If you want to do eight in the morning and eight at 2 p.m., that's fine, but I usually do four milligrams Q6 hours. Opiates are absolutely appropriate. This is an incredibly painful condition that um, we should treat people's pain. This is a great deal of suffering. And again, this is, as we said at the beginning, a negative prognostic factor. So these are folks who may be approaching the end of their lives and should have appropriate symptom control. And then you got to consult neurosurgery. You have to con consult radiation oncology, and I would say even in the middle of the night. And when I've consulted them for a legitimate case of cord compression, I don't get any pushback whatsoever. They, they know this is their, uh, an emergency where they can help. The best outcomes that we've seen are with treatment with steroids, of course, uh, radiation, and surgery. And these are in the most severe cases where folks have lost the ability to walk and the best outcomes in terms of regaining ambulatory function are with trimodality therapy. Now, obviously the decision for surgery is complicated. Somebody with multiple comorbidities or, or maybe an anatomically challenging lesion might not always be a candidate for surgery. But again, that's our kind of gold standard is to do both surgery and radiation in addition to steroids and pain control. Next slide. So that's um, cord compression. Let's dive in on the next case. Tim, do you want to take it away? Sure, sure. Case two, a 54-year-old man presents with facial swelling and cough. Vital signs show normal temperature, blood pressure 160 over 95, heart rate 106, RR20, O2 saturation 92% on room air. Exam reveals facial plethora as well as bilateral uh, jugular venous distension, CT scan of the chest, demonstrates an LUL mass with compression of the SVC in addition to uh, medi uh, mediastinal lymph lymphadenopathy. And let's take a look at the question. What is the most appropriate next step in management? A, chemotherapy. B, combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy. C, corticosteroids. Uh, C is uh, media 
Can you get that one for me? <laughs> yes, uh, mediastinoscopy and biopsy. Great, and E is radiation therapy. All right, and thanks to everyone for jumping in quickly on that. Uh, we'll take just a few more seconds. It looks like we're really settling in on the, the uh, B that combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy. How are they doing, Dr. Stein? So this is a reasonable choice, but not the answer that I uh, had in mind. And so that's good. That means I do have something yeah. to teach after all. Um, and, and the reason for... So, so I would say D, mediastinoscopy and biopsy. And the issue here is that we actually, actually, Tim, will you go back to the case real quick? So we don't have an underlying diagnosis. And that's, that's the challenge in this case, why I would advocate for mediastinoscopy and biopsy, because we need a tissue diagnosis to know how to treat it. So if this is uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or, or Hodgkin's, then certainly chemotherapy and radiation would be appropriate up front. But if this is uh, lung cancer, then uh, we might want to go with cisplatin and etoposide. If it's a small cell, uh, we might choose a different regimen if it's a non-small cell. And I'll point out that while this patient is uncomfortable, certainly, his vitals are not unstable. You know, he's a little hypertensive, a little tachycardic. He's holding on to his oxygen stats. Um, so tricky question, and I, thanks, everybody, for participating. Let's go through the case and hopefully we can learn a little bit more about this. So this is SVC syndrome, which I, I suspect you all picked up on, and this is caused by occlusion of the SVC, the uh, superior vena cava, either due to external compression or internal obstruction. And the reason this is a problem is because it's a low pressure vessel. It's thin walled. It's easy to be compressed by a lymph node or a mass. Obviously the aorta does not get so easily compressed by masses, but um, but this is a low pressure vessel right in the middle of the action. And the symptoms are due to venous distension and pressure behind the obstruction. Next slide. So this is just to remind you of the anatomy. Um, and what I'll point out is uh, the location matters. So if you have a mass that's what we call infra-azagous, so you see the azagous vein taking off from the left of the SVC, and then the SVC comes down into the right atrium. If it's right below there, where the line is that says superior vena cava, those masses are actually less symptomatic because there's that azagous vein that can serve as an offlet valve, a pressure release, and they have less symptoms from congestion and back, back pressure. Whereas if it's supra azagous, so up near the brachiocephalic veins, then you can imagine there's no offset valve and people can be really symptomatic. Next slide. So the etiology, there's a wide range of etiologies for SVC syndrome. There are of course non-malignant causes, including catheter related, right? If somebody has a pick line or a, a port, um, pacemaker leads, especially if infected or thrombosed, there are infectious complications such as uh, tuberculosis, syphilis, histoplasmosis can actually cause a fibrosing mediastinitis, but we are on a cancer lecture, and so we will focus on the malignancy associated causes, and I should say that's 90 plus percent of the cases of SBC are driven by cancer. Um, and the mo most of the time it's, it's lung cancer, either non-small cell is the most common, um, or small cell. Um, Again, it is a negative prognostic factor uh, regardless. Um, lymphoma is the next most common with about 10%. And we can go to the next slide. So again, the presentation is variable. It can be kind of subacute where people have a slow onset of, slow onset of headaches or, or um, hypertension, or it can be quite rapid and quite severe. And again, some of that depends on the location as we showed but also the degree of collateralization. So how many blood vessels are forming to help release that pressure. Sometimes people have swelling in the face, neck, or, or upper extremities, sometimes just one arm or sometimes both. Dilated chest veins. Um, in cirrhosis, you can see an etiology called um, caput medusae, where people get these sort of swollen looking veins around their um, belly button. Uh, you can see kind of the same idea here in SVC syndrome, except it's on the upper chest. You see these really prominent veins. Um, 
shortness of breath, cough, or hoarseness can happen. These are now some of the more troubling uh, symptoms. They can be due to laryngeal edema, which is more of an absolute emergency. And you can see CNS uh, side effects or, or symptoms due to increased intracranial pressure. Uh, headache is one thing, but confusion or lethargy are absolute emergent symptoms that require emergent management. We'll go through that. Next slide. So this is the so-called Pemberton sign. I know we're trying to get away from, uh, you know, these monikers, um, but I don't have another name for it. Uh, you can see this gentleman, his face is, um, you know, relatively normal color and not particularly swollen in, on the A side, but on the B side, when he raises his arms, that increases the uh, pressure and backflow, and thus he uh, gets red and swollen. And so that's kind of a striking indicator to say this is SVC syn uh, syndrome. Next slide. The best diagnostic test here is a CT chest with contrast, and you want the contrast, obviously, because you want good um, imaging of the vessels. MR venography is an alternative in folks uh, who can't get a CT for whatever reason. And generally, the answer is that you want tissue. Um, next, advance, please. I think I have a couple more things on this slide. Um, usually, so this is kind of the key point of that question. And again, you know, you could sort of make an argument either way. But usually, you have enough time to get the tissue so that you can guide the right therapy. Again, if this is a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma or a Hodgkin's or something like that, then you're going to give rituximab-based chemotherapy, right, versus a platinum if it's a lung cancer. So these are really different treatment courses. Um, radiation can be used in either, but it's not necessary. Let's say a Hodgkin's lymphoma, you might skip the radiation entirely, whereas a small cell lung cancer, you definitely would do radiation. So again, uh, variability in the treatment approach, that means you kind of want to get the answer right. Uh, next. So the true emergencies are if there is strider or respiratory compromise or lethargy or coma due to either laryngeal edema or that increased ICP. And in those cases, even then, it's not going to be targeted at uh, shrinking the cancer emergently. It's going to be stenting open that SVC so that we can relieve that um, pressure obstruction. So this is going to be with your uh, colleagues in interventional radiology to place an endovascular stent. Um, or thrombolysis if there's a sort of clot component within the SVC. And um, uh, I will say they've been really good with us when we've had these cases. These are very short-term measures, but, uh, but if needed, then you got to do them. Next. So, and this is, this is the other piece, right? People will call, you know, I'm a fellow, so I get all kinds of uh, consults, and sometimes people say we need emergent chemotherapy. And there sort of is no such thing as emergent chemotherapy, and this is why. It takes one to two weeks to have benefit. So you don't want to rush into it. You want to, you want to make the, the right decision, the right choice, so that p patients get the best response. And even radiotherapy, which we think of as a really fast-acting treatment modal modality, still could take two or three days before patients see, see benefit. Steroids are indicated in SVC syndrome if there is laryngeal edema, or let's say you know that it's a lymphoma, previously diagnosed lymphoma, then steroids would be very appropriate, but otherwise not of that much help, and nor are diuretics. Next slide. So that's it for SVC syndrome, and Tim, if you don't mind, I'll just take over the questions, so sure. I spare you some of my uh, challenging <laughs> questions. Um, so this is case three. We have an 85-year-old woman who presents with fatigue, lethargy, and constipation. She has advanced breast cancer, known, known diagnosis, and bony metastatic disease. She does not have previous medical history aside from her cancer. But when she comes in, she has an elevated calcium to 15.1. So this will be a poll everywhere question. And you guys can enter on your devices. What is the most appropriate immediate next step? We have a, intravenous bisphosphonate, B, intravenous furosemide, C, IV glucocorticoids, or D, IV normal saline. And I'll point out that this is what is the most appropriate immediate next step. 
Great. And take just uh, three or four more seconds if you haven't had a chance to uh, answer yet. All right, Dr. Stein, we seem to be sort of settling in on A, although uh, more people moving it to D as well. How are they doing? They are, th the early comers and the late comers are going to take this one, Tim. Um, and I think I clued them in when I pointed out the immediate next step. So bisp bisphosphonates are absolutely appropriate for this patient with mm -hmm. hypercalcemia, but the first step in management is fluid resuscitation. Great. And we can go ahead. So uh, this is hypercalcemia, not, not a hard diagnosis to make when you have an elevated calcium level. Um, and the most common cause among inpatients or patients presenting in the emergency department is cancer, even those without a known diagnosis. So this statistic, I think, is pretty impressive, um, that take all comers to the ED with an elevated uh, calcium, even if they don't have a cancer diagnosis, malignancy will ultimately di be diagnosed in over a third of those. So this is really, in the inpatient setting, you have to think cancer for an elevated calcium. And again, it's quite common. So affects up to a fifth of cancer patients, and again, a poor prognostic factor. 50% um, of patients will not survive beyond a month with, um, with hypercalcemia of malignancy. Next slide. The pathophysiology, I used to think this was always in the setting of bone disease, that it was, you know, cancer chewing up the bones and freeing calcium. But that's actually not, that's actually a, a less common cause. So the most common etiology is um, tumor secretion of this PTH-related protein, parathyroid-related um, protein that essentially revs, this is just something that is secreted by a lot of cancers, and it revs up the osteoclasts so that they are chewing up and liberating calcium. And, and in addition to the bone effects, they're activating the kidneys to to retain calcium as well, and that is what cause, that's what drives the elevated um, calcium. Of course, there can also be bony metastatic disease where the cancer is actually chewing up um, bone and releasing cytokines, revving up osteoclasts and releasing calcium. And then, you know, ectopic secretion of PTH. I feel like I've been tested on that about you know 25 times, and I've never seen it in my life. So. Uh, these are uncommon etiologies that we that occasionally show up in textbooks. Next slide. Uh, and going ahead, and, there's an animation that you can go ahead and do. You know, many malignancies are associated with hypercalcemia. Almost anything can do it. I just want to highlight some of the, the top most common causes are breast cancer, multiple, especially advanced breast cancer. We see hypercalcemia a lot. Multiple myeloma. In fact, it's one of the diagnostic criteria and squamous cell carcinoma. Basically of all types, you know, lung squamous cell carcinoma is one of the more common ones, but head and neck can do it as well. Many other um, squames can do it. Next slide. The symptoms, so I, I made a little remark that it's easy to diagnose hypercalcemia, but I should step back from that. If you don't have the labs in front of you, it can actually sort of be a vague presentation. Folks might feel weak or tired. They might be thirsty, have to urinate frequently. Um, that's nephrogenic DI, so essentially all that calcium acts as a natriuretic and makes you pee. It's an osmotic diuretic. Um, GI symptoms, again, these can be vague. Abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, constipation, uh, psychiatric symptoms, either cognitive slowing or apathy, uh, bone pain. In medical school, we learned this stones, bones, groans, and psychiatric overtones um, I don't know if that's helpful to anyone, but again, it can be some sort of vague symptoms that would prompt you to think of making sure that you have a calcium as a part of your lab workup. Next. And the diagnosis, of course, is on labs. Uh, and I'll just point out, you know, we have mild, moderate, severe, less than 12 is mild, greater than 14 is severe, but all of this, again, is going to depend on the acuity. So how quickly did the calcium rise? Somebody with the calcium of 13 that happened within a couple of days might be far more symptomatic than a patient with a calcium of 15 who's had it for weeks to months. And remember that 50% uh, of calcium is albumin bound, and so uh, you need to check an albumin and use a corrected cal calcium or just get an ionized calcium to get an accurate value. Next slide. <clears throat> 
EKG findings, I actually don't recommend this as your primary diagnostic test for hypercalcemia, but there are some characteristic findings in which patients have a shortened QT interval, as you can see on the left there, or a Osborne or J wave, which is on the right. That's not specific to hypercalcemia. You can see it in things like hypothermia as well. But if you see that in the right constellation, it uh, should prompt you to think about hypercalcemia. Next slide. So treatment. So you guys, you guys were on, everybody was on it. Uh, bisphosphonates are the hallmark of therapy in order to lower the calcium. But um, I want to make this point. The immediate treatment is fluids. And really, we need to be aggressive with fluids in these patients. The idea is you're trying to wash out all that calcium. Because of that um, uh, polyuria, folks are going to be peeing more because the calcium is drawing out the urine. Almost everybody's dehydrated when they come in the door. So they come in dehydrated, which means you need to volume resuscitate them, get them back the fluid that they need, but also help wash out that um, calcium. So I'm pretty aggressive with fluids, often starting with a, a liter bolus and then a fast, aggressive initial rate of 200 to 300 mils per hour. Um, somewhere in the lore is that diuretics are part of the treatment of hypercalcemia. Nobody fell for that on my, um, on my poll, but they really are not part of the treatment. They are only a treatment if fluids are causing problems. So we've adequately fluid resuscitated or we're running out of room to give more fluids. We are having heart failure, the patient's renal failure, and we need to use diuretics to help give more fluids. Bisphosphonates, again, you guys got it right. They block those osteoclasts, whether they're activated locally or by the PTHRP, and they kind of normalize things. Um, however, it takes a day or two for them to kick in. Um, any agent is fine. Zolandronic acid is what we use the most commonly, but it doesn't matter. Whatever's on formulary at your facility is absolutely appropriate. The key thing to remember with the bisphosphonates is that they do require renal dose adjustments. And as many patients with hypercalcemia, as we've said, are dehydrated or have some renal insufficiency, we often have to dose adjust these. Calcitonin is not required, but is a reasonable option in patients who are quite symptomatic in whom you're, you're trying to temporize while you're waiting for the bisphosphonates to kick in. They're only effective for about a day or two because there's rapid uh, calciphylaxis, but you can use these for a day or two if needed for someone with severe symptoms. Next slide. Um, steroids are rarely indicated in, the, in that example of the increased calcitriol production. Again, you can check a calcitriol level, uh, but I would think of this as less common. And in some patients, you need hemodialysis, right? You've, you've volume resuscitated them so aggressively um, that, that you put them into either renal failure or heart failure, you know, this is obviously not ideal. You'd rather stop short of this, but, um, but it may be necessary to get people's calcium levels reversed. Next slide. Um, so here's another case. 26-year-old man presenting with two weeks of rapidly enlarging cervical lymphadenopathy, abdominal distension, and fever. His vitals, he's febrile to 39, he's hypotensive, 90s over 60s, he's, he's tachycardic to 115, and to kypnic to 24. He has significant cervical and axillary lymphadenopathy, spleen is palpable, and you notice a firm abdominal mass on your exam. He's anemic to 10, his white blood cell count is 65, the majority of which are atypical lymphocytes, and he's mildly thrombocytopenic. He has a significant renal injury with a kidney, a creatinine of 3.8, an LDH of 12,000, phosphate of 9.9 .9 elevated, potassium elevated at 6.6, .6, and a uric acid of 18. This is a sick patient. I guess you didn't get it. Um, he, and, and a lymph node biopsy, let's say, was done last week and reveals uh, Burkitt lymphoma. Let's see the options, and this will be a poll everywhere. Question, what is the most appropriate immediate next step in treatment for this ill patient? Combination chemotherapy, option A. Option B, corticosteroids. Option C, hemodialysis, IV saline and rasburicase. Or D, radiation therapy. And we'll give you guys um, a few seconds here to make some selections. <clears throat> 
All right, that looks like that's settling in. Dr. Stein, how are they doing with this one? They're doing outstanding. So exactly, a potassium of 6.6, .6, substantial renal injury. You guys are right on it. Um, and for those of you in the A camp, don't worry, we will give him chemo as quickly as we can as well. Go on to the next slide. So this is tumor lysis syndrome. Um, this is most commonly seen in, ag in aggressive hematologic malignancies, so high-grade lymphoma, such as in our case with Burkitt's, acute myeloid leukemia. Most commonly, we see this after somebody's gotten treatment with chemotherapy, but you can see it as in our case spontaneously, especially if there's a large tumor burden, where essentially there's autolysis. Um, uncommonly, we can see this after the treatment of solid tumors, and the idea here is that there is uh, cell destruction that releases all these intracellular contact, contents that causes metabolic derangements. So again, whether that's chemo that's destroying all those cells, whether that's the cancer itself in AML or Burkitt that's chewing itself up, killing off cells as it's growing, um, that's where this comes from, is the release of those uh, intracellular contents. Next slide. So, the, and I think you can advance maybe two more just to show us all the um, lab abnormalities. Thanks. Um, hyperkalemia is the most troubling as it can cause uh, life-threatening arrhythmias. Hyperuricemia is, is kind of one of the hallmarks of this. Um, and it can crystallize in renal tubules, which causes an obstructive uropathy and renal dysfunction, as we saw in our patient, and, and indeed renal failure. An elevated phosphate level, the phosphate is released from the cells. Um, for those who find this confusing because some levels are up, some levels are down, potassium, uric acid, and phosphate are released from the cell. Those all go up. The phosphate then drops the calcium. And the low calcium can then cause problems of its own, including tetany, seizures, arrhythmias. Next slide. And when we think about treatment, we want to first think about prevention. So what are the risk factors for tumor lysis syndrome? High-grade lymphoma, such as Burkitt's, and have starred the most, the highest risk factors. Um, ALL, uh, with a WBC count of above 100,000, or AML, with a WBC above 50. And I should point out, that's because the blasts in AML are particularly sticky and active on the endothelial membrane, and they can rupture and cause problems much more easily. So even at a lower um, WBC count, they can cause problems. Uh, anything with a high tumor cell proliferation rate, you're usually going to know that from the KEY67 or the KI67 on a PATH report. Something like small cell lung cancer is, doesn't fall into a traditional risk factor, but often has exceedingly high KI67s and, and can then cause tumor lysis syndrome. Anything that's chemosensitive, again, uh, leukemia, small cell lung cancer, things that we know the chemo is going to have a rapid, strong effect. And anybody with a large tumor burden, bulky disease, elevated WBC count, elevated pretreatment LDH count, um, level of two times the upper limit of normal, and then anything that's going to impair the body's ability to handle that metabolic strain, either dehydration or preexisting renal disease. Next slide. So again, let's think about prevention as cure. Our first goal is to not have any issues with tumor lysis in the first place. So if somebody is at high or intermediate risk, any of those three starred categories or multiple of the lower category um, uh, criteria, then we want to initiate allopurinol because that decreases the formation of uric acid. And I'll show you the metabolic pathway in a second here. So pr prophylactic allopurinol, usually 300 milligrams daily, IV fluids, so on admission to the hospital, almost all of our patients who are getting induction chemotherapy with acute myeloid leukemia are started on fluids to help reduce this problem. Resburicase we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, we don't usually use it as a prophylactic, but if somebody comes in with an extremely high uric acid before treatment, then it might be appropriate to lead with resburicase as a preventive strategy. And the treatment, again, is fluids. We have to help the body flush all of those um, electrolyte abnormalities, normalize the renal function. Incredibly effective medication. Again, I'll show you the pathway in a second here. 
but it breaks down uric acid to allantoin. Uric acid is not very soluble, gets stuck in those renal tubules, causes kidney problems. Allantoin, easily soluble, easy to excrete in the urine. We consider it again if there's pre-existing hyperuricemia, but if you're finding that patients are not responding to aggressive fluid resuscitation, then resburicase is incredibly effective at dropping that uric acid level. I've seen it go from 15, 16, 17 down to undetectable with a single dose. The downside, and I know there's some pharmacists on this call, the downside is that it is quite an expensive medication, and so we do want to be judicious in the use of that. There is a relative contraindication, which is G6PD deficiency. Um, patients with G6PD um, deficiency, if we give them resburicase, this can induce um, hemolysis. It creates oxidative stress and can induce hemolysis and met hemoglobinemia. I would describe this, again, as a relative contraindication if somebody is, as our patient was, quite sick, renal dysfunction, um, electrolyte abnormalities. They need the resburicase, and then we just need to be aware to look out for the possibility of hemolytic abnormalities or um, low oxygen levels that reflect hemoglobinemia. Obviously, we're going to reverse the potassium, insulin, dextrose, um, bicarb, and hemodialysis in severe cases. Next slide. So here's that purine catabolic pathway, and this is the point I want to make. So purines are part of DNA, so DNA breakdown is going to generate this pathway. And so cell rupture, again, is going to generate this pathway. You can see purines at the top get broken down to hypoxanthine, which is broken down to xanthine, uric acid, and ultimately allantone for excretion. Uric acid, I want everybody to look at the uric acid there. That's the marker that we're seeing elevated in tumor lysis. Allopurinol blocks the upstream steps, so it reduces the speed at which these broken down cells generate uric acid, which means you can prevent people from getting into big trouble. If they already have tumor lysis, allopurinol is not going to get you out of the woods, right? It might, might help not add fuel to the fire, but it's not going to break down all that uric acid that's now causing problems. And so to help that process, the body's enzyme is called urate oxidase, and our pharmacologic strategy is called resburicase, and that will rapidly take things from the insoluble or low-soluble um, uric acid to highly soluble allantoin, which can be excreted. Next. All right, we're at 12.47. Why don't I do one more case, and then I want to um, give people a chance for questions. Tim, does that sound okay? Uh, yes, that sounds perfect, Dr. Stone. Okay. So this is a 28-year-old, previously healthy woman who comes in with three weeks of progressive fatigue, dyspnea on exertion, and easy bruising. Her vitals are here. She's a febrile, normal blood pressure, a little bit tachycardic, a little bit tachypneic. Her oxygen saturation is low, 83%. She reverse, she improves, although she takes four liters to do so. Um, exam reveals petechiae, ecchymoses, bruises, pallor, mild cervical lymphadenopathy. You hear crackles in her lung bases without any peripheral edema, and her spleen and, and um, liver do not feel enlarged. She has significant lab abnormality. She's quite anemic, hemoglobin of 7.4. Uh, her WBC count is 108,000 with an ANC of 400 and severe um, thrombocytopenia with a pose of 18. Um, her other labs are reasonably normal. Her, uh, L her fibrinogen and D-dimer are up, and you see blasts on the peripheral blood smear. So let's see the answer choices. And everyone can answer on their poll everywhere. Which of the following is the most appropriate treatment? Option A is imatinib. B is induction chemotherapy, C is leukapheresis, and D is rituximab. All right. Looks like uh, most folks are honing in on induction chemotherapy. How are they doing? So I would go with leukapheresis in this case. Um, and let's go back to the case again. So, it, so the patient has AML, acute myeloid leukemia, or at least that's our suspicion at this, at this time point. So absolutely will need induction chemotherapy. 
The tricky part here is what's the emergency? And the emergency is leukostasis. So she has a WBC count of 100,000 of these big sticky blasts. We're going to go through that in some more detail. But the key finding in the question, and I'll admit it's a little subtle, is that she's hypoxic. So those big sticky blasts are causing problems to the point where she um, is not having effective oxygen exchange. She's, she's short of breath. She's hypoxic and, and crackles in the lung bases. And so that is an acute emergency that I would uh, probably do leukophoresis, although reasonable people can disagree about this. Sometimes you can get uh, chemo done before you get the leukophoresis, so, um, so I won't ding you guys too much. Let's go ahead to the case and talk, uh, go ahead to the slides and talk about it some more. Great. And just to let people know that I have opened up the questions slide and poll everywhere, so you can start going ahead and entering your questions for Dr. Stein while he finishes up this case. Great, and I'll let you put up the symptoms of leukostasis for me when you get a chance. So um, it can be, it can affect many organ systems. So pulmonary, in, as in our patient, those big sticky blasts are causing problems, causing shortness of breath, hypoxia, infiltrates on chest x-ray. Neurologic is one of the other common ones that gets us really concerned, is if patients are altered, are having blurry vision or double vision, headache. Uh, ringing in the ears. I'm not going to take somebody to leukophoresis just for that. Fever's common, um, and that is thought to be really more just of an inflammatory response. And spontaneous tumor lysis, kind of, you can see how that would happen. The, all those big cells are breaking down and causing tumor lysis. And DIC is a consumptive coagulopathy that you can see in these patients that's certainly a high-risk uh, condition as well. Next. So let's kind of do some definitions. Hyperleukocytosis is a WBC count of above 100,000. That doesn't necessarily mean leukostasis. There, there are um, entities such as CLL where people can have really quite high white counts and not have any problems. The problem is the, the condition that causes problems is leukostasis. So that's these big sticky cells that are increasing the viscosity. They cause essentially clots, these white cell plugs in, the, in little blood vessels, they get stuck and, um, and they rev up the endothelium. So they are active in the blood cells, they're sticking together, they're, they're blocking off organs and causing end organ compromise. That is leukostasis and that is an emergency. We see it most commonly in acute myeloid leukemia. We can see it in ALL. We can see it in CML, although it's only in blast crisis, so when there's those big sticky blasts. Whereas things like CLL, CML, we can see really elevated WBC counts, 200, 300, even 400,000, where the patient feels totally asymptomatic. Next. So how do we treat it? So first of all, this is my case to treat it. It's got a one-week mortality of approaching 50% if we don't treat it. So this is absolutely an emergency. So if the patient is asymptomatic, then we want to start with hydroxyurea, and we're pretty aggressive with the dose, 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams up to every six hours. So really aggressive hydroxyurea dosing to bring down those WBC counts, or as many of you selected, induction chemotherapy. But if you see symptoms, pulmonary compromise, you know, hypoxia, or CNS symptoms, altered mental status, certainly coma, then uh, I would advocate that those patients, at least we should be considering leukophoresis, where we actually take off all of those um, big sticky blasts so that they stop causing problems. Now, this is complicated, right? They have to go to the ICU. They need a big central line. You need transfusion medicine to have input. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, the medical team may decide, their platelets are too low. We don't want to put them through this big procedure. Let's just get them induction chemotherapy, and that's not unreasonable. So I want to—I know I said it was a different answer, but it's not unreasonable to go straight to induction. But you should at least be thinking about leukophoresis in these cases. Of course, you're going to give them hydration and allopurinol for tumor lysis prophylaxis. And the last key point I want to make here, and I think this is my final point, is avoid transfusions prior to leukoreduction if possible. So if um, People will see that they're anemic and want to transfuse them, but remember, they have increased viscosity. They're already having problems from all those extra cells around. We don't want to tip them over the edge. 
and we'll save those for later. All right, and let me reactivate that uh, question slide. Yeah. Bear with me while I go ahead and move forward to the end of the slide. We're going to skip through case seven as well and jump back to and so this is a great time uh, for you to go ahead and share your questions with Dr. Stein, whether it's a follow-up to one of the cases that he discussed here, or whether it's a question about a, an oncologic emergency that wasn't covered here. Uh, go ahead and submit those. I, I have one while we're waiting for others to share their questions. Dr. Stein, going back to that first case uh, with spinal cord compression, um, can you help explain in a little more detail why the prognosis is, is so poor for those individuals with, uh, with, with showing those symptoms. And I, I was also curious, uh, do you have situations where a patient might have had uh, pre-existing anomalies in, in the spinal cord that were previously asymptomatic, but because of everything else going on with treatment become symptomatic and are uh, that where the prognosis is not necessarily as as dim as it would be if that was uh, coming on for the first time. Yeah, great, great question, Tim. And I'll I'll just say that's kind of how I got into um, some of my work on oncologic emergencies was related to cord compression because I've seen some cases go south and some cases go well, um, which has gotten me really interested. So, so a couple of points to that. So first of all, um, in in patients who have a solid tumor, breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, those are the most common types. Um, the presence of metastatic disease, if it's involved in the spine, that by definition, by definition means it's uh, metastatic stage four, not, not curable, certainly mm -hmm. treatable, but not curable. And so you have to think this is already a patient population who is, um, who doesn't have the best prognosis. And I, I didn't really discuss it in my uh, slides, but I should say palliative care involvement is almost always appropriate in these cases. Not to say you don't treat them, because because I think there's a lot of things we can do to help support them, but thinking about what their priorities are, symptom control, um, and how they want it to go ahead. But I think your point is also really well taken, which is, um, so prostate cancer, men with metastatic prostate cancer and bone disease can live for years, right? So if we can stabilize that lesion, get preserve their neurologic function get them on on a good treatment might be abiraterone might be pills right um and and lupron shots they may have years of quality life ahead of them same with multiple myeloma people that have a really high risk lesion from multiple myeloma but if we but we can put that into remission for uh, many many years so so definitely i don't want to make it sound like these patients are at the end of the at the end of the road we want to stabilize them as much as possible to get them as much quality of life as, as we can. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have questions coming in. Is there any known utility in adding uh, uh, resveratrol in a patient who has required uh, hemodialysis anyways, or in patients who need HD, can it be omitted? So, um, so you're right. We usually lead with the HD and kind of see what their uric acid does. Um, it is generally uh, dialyzed that you can pull off the uric acid. So if it drops appropriately, then you don't necessarily need to add it. So uh, I, you're not meaning to nitpick me, but you're right. My, my question and answer wasn't totally right. Um, but I think sometimes we do have to do it. And that's, that's dependent on the course of the uric acid. So if it, we get them on hemodialysis and it drops nicely, um, Great. We don't need the resbeer case. If we get them on HD and it's not coming down the way we need it to, then we might still want to pursue the resbeer case. Great question. Great. Thank you, Dr. Stein. Another one. Uh, do you see much APML and what education at state level is provided to uh, rural ERs to recognize this emergency? Yeah. Gosh, great question. APML, for those who don't know, acute promyelocytic leukemia. Um, it is uh, potentially devastating in the short term. 30-day mortality is on the order of 50%. But if we can get them on the appropriate treatment, uh, it is basically the most curable of the acute myeloid leukemia. So a really important entity to be aware of. Um, I think we could do better on, on education. I, I don't know all the outreach uh, strategies that are being used, but I think it is really important. 
and these are folks who I think should be treated at um, experienced centers um, because because they do they're treated differently. They're treated with atra and arsenic, which is different than the typical seven plus three chemotherapy that the average um, AML receives. Um, so we see a lot of it. Uh, the maybe just the little key point for everybody in the room is a a low ish white cell count, someone with leukemia, but their white cell count is not through the roof, but they also have DIC. They have coagulopathy. Their coags are abnormal. Their PTINR are abnormal. Those patients, you should always think of APML because that's a very common presentation for those folks. Great. Dr. Stein, thank you so much. Uh, we are reaching the, the, the hour, so uh, we're going to go ahead and make a few closing remarks and wrap up. Uh, we want to thank the, the people of North Carolina for their generous support of the University Cancer Research Fund and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. We want to thank the uh, team, the UNC Lineberger Cancer Network team, Mary King, Veneranda Obore, John Powell, and Aaron Schmidt for all of their hard work on this and every one of our lectures.